Now, here is your host, Kim Corbin. While Zen priests typically conjure up images of serious, somber, silently meditating monks, my guest today, best-selling author Brad Warner, who is both a Zen priest and a punk rock bassist, certainly defies that stereotype. And while the similarities between punk rock and Zen might not be immediately obvious to some, they were to Brad as a young punk rocker in the early 80s in Akron, Ohio. As he writes, the people I met at Zen centers I visited were usually older than me and smarter too, and a lot quieter. They were generally almost studiously ignorant of popular culture, the kind of people who don't own TVs or purchase CDs unless they're recordings of Chinese chants or something. Yet I found their philosophy to be deeply appealing for the same reasons I had found punk rock appealing. It was a philosophy that asked questions rather than providing pat answers. It didn't have any time for bullshit. It was completely unpretentious. Zen teachers were rude and uncouth, rebellious, real. I thought that maybe, just maybe, there might be a few people out there who would be interested in Zen if only it weren't presented in such a wimpy, nerdy fashion. And so, Brad Warner's non-wimpy, non-nerdy approach to teaching Zen was born. Brad's first book was called Hardcore Zen, and I personally have had the pleasure of working with him for over a decade now on his five books that New World Library has published, which all have and are amazing titles, including Sit Down and Shut Up, Zen Wrapped in Karma, Dipped in Chocolate, Sex, Sin, and Zen, There Is No God and He's Always With You, and most recently, Don't Be a Jerk. And being the amazingly prolific writer that he is, Brad is also currently hard at work on yet another book that we'll be publishing this fall called It Came From Beyond Zen. I've really been looking forward to having this opportunity to take a deep dive into the hardcore Zen swimming pool. So thank you for being here with me, Brad, and welcome. Thanks. It's a swimming pool, huh? Yeah, we're going swimming. All right. (laughs) I, I thought it would be good to start by having you tell us about how and when you you first discovered Zen. Well, I kind of discovered it by accident. I was a student, as you mentioned, I was a punk rock bass player, and I was a student at Kent State University in Ohio. And I just took a class called Zen Buddhism. I I, I kind of looked at it like a blow-off class, really. I, I I thought it would be interesting, you know, to learn a little bit about Zen Buddhism, but it wasn't it wasn't part of my course curriculum or anything. It was just this extra class I took, I think, to make up hours to be full time student. You know how the, you do that sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I did not expect it to to change my whole life. I, I just found the philosophy and the practice to be incredibly straightforward and practical in a way that I did not expect. You know, I just thought, um, I, I don't know what I thought, but uh, but I, I just kept pursuing it because it made so much sense. What I was it? Kept, yeah, what was it that most appealed to you at the time, would you say? Uh, just... Uh, well, I, I was interested in philosophy and religion, and I'd been sort of pursuing that. I'd gone to a few churches and, and tried to to figure out what was going on there. I was raised in a very um, a religious family. We weren't. It wasn't like a, a atheist family or anything. It's just you know one of these kind of American families that don't have a religion. You know, there's a lot of us around. Uh, I think. So I didn't have any any religious background, but I I, I got interested in in it in my teens, and I I went to some churches, and I was really disappointed because I could see through uh, what they were saying. I, I, and I don't mean to impugn all of Christianity that way, but in rural Ohio, the type of Christianity you're going to get, especially in those days, is not going to be probably the best version. And so I was uh, I was really disappointed. I went to the Hare Krishnas because I thought, okay, well, this is as far removed from uh, mainstream Christianity as you're going to get. And I found out that the Hare Krishnas were basically mainstream Christianity only with, <laughs> with you know, a Hindu background. It seemed to be exactly the same philosophy. Uh, believe us or you're going to go to hell. Well, in their case, you're going to get a bad reincarnation. Uh, so, so 
when I when I took that class in Zen, I was kind of not expecting much, but I found that it was really straightforward. There was no there was no belief system. This is what this is what was incredible to me. The other places I'd looked to for religious instruction were telling me what I should believe, and I couldn't understand why what I believed up in my head had any bearing on you know my eternal future. Or I wasn't even convinced. Uh, there was any eternal future to worry about. So, so the idea that I should have a certain set of beliefs because they're going to help me in my after death life, uh, just didn't make any sense because I didn't believe in life after death to begin with. So why should I worry about how to make it a good one? I, so I, uh, I, I just, I just found it eminently practical. Everything was, everything was about, uh, what goes on right now and what you do right now without any sort of idea of a, a, a dogma to accept or a future life to worry about. And I've heard you say that a Zen practice doesn't say do this and you'll find magic. It says do this and you'll find out what is really happening. And that quote really struck me because early in my own consciousness work, I definitely leaned more toward the magical thinking, law of attraction, put the positive vibes out and they come back to you kind of end of the spectrum. And at first I could not understand why Buddhists wouldn't want to be attached to the good feelings in life. I didn't get it at all. And Mm. then I went through my own dark night of the soul experience, which has Mm. helped me realize that going deep into this kind of consciousness work ultimately requires us to be able to hold both the dark and the light aspects of our existence. Mm. And so I'm, I'm curious what you would say about how a Zen practice can help us begin to do that. Yeah, that, that darkness is a, is an important aspect and people uh, understandably fear going into that. I I don't know uh, how it helps. Well, I I suppose one of the reasons I got into it was I was sort of a dark person to begin with. I mean, I was in a punk rock band. We had a song called Drop the A-Bomb on me after all. So I wasn't, (laughs) you know, I wasn't sort of a a light, happy person to begin with. But but I so so uh, finding a way to deal with the darkness was very important to me because I didn't feel like there was any escape from it. And and I suppose the way it helps is by allowing you to kind of um, uh, approach it in a very c- sort of controlled way, I'd, I, I would say maybe. Um, because you're doing a zazen practice, which is basically sitting on a cushion, staring at a wall, not really trying to make anything happen. A lot of meditation is about trying to make something happen, but, but zen is not. You're just you're just sitting. And um, in this kind of controlled format, when those, when those things come up, when those dark things and whatever come up, you, uh, you're able to, to kind of sit there steadily and, and hold on to yourself or to something like yourself. <laughs> we get into that um, uh, while it goes on around you. It also helped that I had a good teacher. I had two good teachers uh, who I could uh, talk to about this, but without any sort of dogma attached to it, which meant that there was no uh, sort of push for me to have the right sort of view about it. Whatever, whatever kind of experience or reaction to that experience I had was, was okay with my teachers, uh, and that, that helped a lot as well. Right. What does your your current meditation practice look like? Uh, well, it's uh, literally what it looks like is me sitting and looking at the wall on a cushion. Uh, but uh, I suppose the best description of it, it's called shikantaza, which is just a Japanese word that means just sitting. But the the it doesn't translate very accurately into English because the the word that we translate as just actually comes from a word that means to hit something, like to hit a nail on the head. So it means doing exactly sitting and nothing else. Uh, and and so the practice is is you're trying to just sit quietly, but in a very um, 
I was going to say concentrated. It's not necessarily a concentrated way, but a, but a very deliberate way, I suppose. So you're, you're just trying to focus on the real action of being still and being quiet for uh, a, a set period of time. For me, it's usually 30 minutes, but uh, other people do it longer or shorter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've also said that meditation is as important to us as humans as exercise or good nutrition, yet we think that it's optional. Mm. So I'm curious why it's so important for us to meditate. And if you think that the fact that the majority of us don't do so on a regular basis is part of the reason that our country and world are facing some of the challenges we're currently facing. Well, I do think so. And in the the metaphor I usually like to bring to it, when pe- people often who, who want to do a meditation practice will ask me about how they get into it and how they continue. And I'm, my best way of describing how I was able to do that is is by likening it to brushing my teeth. Like there was a point, <clears throat> I think in all of our lives, certainly in mine, where I had to be kind of forced to, to brush my teeth, you know, yelled at by my mom or kind of... And, and then at some point in my life, I realized that brushing my teeth was something that... that that actually had some benefit that I could see and, and, and understand clearly. So I no longer needed to be told to do it. I just did it. And I also discovered that when I didn't do it, uh, I didn't feel good. I felt kind of crummy, you know, my breath was bad and I just, you know, <laughs> nobody wanted to talk to me and all the rest of that. So, uh, so, um, now I've got, Oh, Oh, why it's so, so I think it's, it's, akin to brushing your teeth in terms of necessity for a healthy life. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, there there was a time in the past when humans didn't brush their teeth and... And, you know, we, we survived, but, uh, but things have become better because we're now all brushing our teeth and most of us are brushing our teeth. Uh, and you brush your teeth not just for yourself, but for others, you know, for, for, so you won't offend people or make them grossed out or sick. I, I think it's the same kind of thing. And, and I think it's, 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 it's a kind of a, I believe, this is my slightly utopian belief, that in the future, people will look back on our time and go, they didn't meditate every day? You know, they, they'll, they'll think it's weird that the vast majority of people didn't do it, and they'll probably understand that, oh, that's why they had so much trouble. Yeah. Uh, they just, they, they just weren't meditating. And, and I think it's something we, we need to do. Uh, obviously, it's something we can survive without, but I think you, you have a, a much, much more improved experience in life if you do it. And why is something as simple as sitting in silence so scary and difficult for us to do? You know, that's a good question because I, I do run across it. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my sister was visiting and I and I said, she, she happened to come on a Saturday when we have our regular meditation day. And uh, she didn't want to do it. She ended up going and, and taking a walk and coming back. Uh, and, I, and I was saying to her, it's just, you're just sitting quietly for, for 30 minutes. You know, there's <laughs> nothing to it. Uh, but it was, it was a big deal to her. And it's a big deal to a lot of people. Um, Boredom, I suppose, is is something we we fear because we become very used to having a lot of stimulation in our lives. So we don't know what to do if we're just kind of stuck with no entertainment for for a period. I, I think people are kind of scared of what they might find, and 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 sometimes you do find scary things during meditation. But usually, you have to meditate for. A while, most 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 people's initial experience of meditation is boredom. Uh, but but the boredom is is actually really good and really instructive because you you if you go deeply into boredom, you kind of find out what that really is and why it's why we fear it uh, when when we don't really need to fear boredom. And and eventually, as you continue on it, you start having insights, and those are those can be pretty amazing. So it's a whole it's a whole program. Yeah, you get the good with the bad. <laughs> yeah. 
so this <laughs> excerpt is that I'm going to read is from Sit Down and Shut Up, which was published in 2007. And you're referring to the Iraq war that was happening at the time. But some of the ideas here are just really timely as far as what's going on in reaction to Donald Trump right now. Mm. So I wanted to share this and, and talk about it a little bit. Okay. You write, I begin to... I began to notice that neither the warmongers nor the peaceniks had the slightest clue about what the real situation was. None of them has the courage to look deeply into themselves, to find the source of war itself, which is ultimately the same as the source of anger, and to rip it out of their guts, because that is more difficult than marching with picket signs or firing guns and dropping bombs. It's far more repulsive to us to really face up to who and what we actually are than it is to face the prospect of fires and bombs and blood and misery. We would gladly choose war any day of the week over that, quite literally. You can get all self-righteous and pretend that there's a big difference between the anger you feel at some warmongering politician or general and the anger those guys feel toward whomever they're labeled as the enemy this week. But is there... You need to find out. You really, really do. <laughs> Whenever I hear something uh, that I've written a long time ago, I always, I always go, "Oh, that guy sounds so belligerent." You know? <laughs> <laughs> he sounds so combative. <laughs> uh, that, that Brad Warner guy. Uh, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I think, uh, but I still, I still uh, find that to be true. I, I, I think a, a lot of what we project in the outside world is actually something that's present in ourselves, including war and and divisiveness and and all of the rest. And it's very easy to to externalize that and say, okay, those guys are the problem. And and we all do it. uh, But, um, but to see that you are, you are actually the problem and to see that, that all the things that you, you think are wrong with the outside world are actually things that are wrong with you. That's, that's a tough one. And, and, and for myself, a lot of, a lot of the reason I sound belligerent in these old pieces of writing is, is because I'm writing to myself. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really saying that to me. Uh, because uh, because I was uh, I was like that, and I and I had to to gradually start to face that that uh, that there was no uh, big bad other out there. I mean, I mean, there are, there are of course problems that go on in the world that need to be addressed, and I'm not saying a lot of times if I get into this line of of. Of talking about things, uh, people think I'm advocating for a kind of complacency, but I don't think complacency is the answer either. Uh, still, if you don't, if you're not able to acknowledge how you are part of the problem, I don't think you can ever address the problem in a in a way that's meaningful. I mean, you can kind of put a band aid on it that way, and you can kind of knock a few people's heads and, until they uh, are forced to to do what you think is right. But that that's a, a really short term solution, uh, and uh, and it's one we've pursued an awful lot in the past. It has <laughs> never really worked out. No, it hasn't. And I, and I think it comes back to what we were talking personally of what we were talking about before that we haven't collectively gone deep into our own consciousness work and to examine this stuff. And we don't meditate all the time. And we, and, and because of that, it's like, it's showing up in our collective unconsciousness and we in weird ways. That's. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think, I think there's a lot of, a lot of what can, what's going on now can be understood that way. And, and I, and I think of Zen or, or any sort of meditation or consciousness uh, work, uh, as a long term project, you know, I, I feel like we're we're at the beginning and we're taking baby steps. Buddha lived twenty five hundred years ago, but even twenty five hundred years is is short. And I, and I think what we're we're working on is something that will take place over a very long time scale. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, it it might be hundreds of thousands of years before it's ever really realized but i i think that once it is realized uh, you'll see a different kind of humanity and i love i love science fiction and time travel stories but i think if you actually did travel forward a thousand years in the future what you, you would find what i hope you would find would be a humanity that's radically different 
from what it is today, so much so that you might not even recognize what was going on or understand people anymore. Um, uh, but I, but I do, I do have a lot of optimism for where it's going, even though there are, of course, a lot of bumps to get through before we get to that. <laughs> yeah. Darkness and light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your latest book, Don't Be a Jerk in the title and, and kind of what that's all about. Yeah, sure. Um, well, Don't Be a Jerk is my, okay. There was a guy named Dogen who lived 800 years ago, often mispronounced Dogen, uh, but it's Dogen, uh, who lived 800 years ago in Japan. And he wrote a book called Shobo Genzo, which is Treasury of the True Dharma I, that at the time it was written was largely forgotten. It, it was sort of put away on a shelf somewhere or a few different copies were hand copied. And there might have been a dozen or two dozen copies around mostly not being read in the basements of various Zen temples in Japan. But that that book uh, was rediscovered uh, first in Japan eh, about a hundred years ago or so, um, and then gradually uh, in by Western people, uh, and and it's now kind of becoming more influential, and and it is it has been the basis of the kind of Zen practice I've been doing for the past you know twenty or almost thirty years, I guess. Uh, it, it, so it. Um, it's an important book, but because it's so old and because it's in Japanese, it's very hard for most people to understand. And there are some good translations available nowadays in English, but, but even those good translations are a bear to get through because they're just, they're, they're trying to hew very close to the original Japanese text. So what I've done with the Don't Be a Jerk is, is I just decided to rewrite Shobo Kenzo, uh, in my own words. I was inspired by a, a book called God is Disappointed in You, which, uh, in which a guy took the entire Bible and, uh, rewrote it in his own words to, to kind of humorous effect. Uh, I, I'm trying something that's a little different from, from putting it out as a piece of humor. I, it, I think it's funny, but, but I'm more, uh, trying to, to find the essence of, of Shobo Genzo and present it in a way that you don't have to be a scholar of ancient Japanese to understand. <laughs> and what about Don't Be a Jerk? What's the, the title? Oh, what's the title? Well, there's a, there's a chapter called Shoaku Makusa, which means, uh, do not enact wrong things. And when I, when I came to that chapter, I decided to change the title to Don't Be a Jerk. And Dogen says this Shoaku Makusa, this Don't Be a Jerk, is the most fundamental aspect of Buddhist practice, more fundamental than anything philosophical uh, or, or any of the other stuff that people kind of uh, talk about most of the time, was simply just uh, don't, don't be a jerk. Don't, don't do what you know to be harmful to, to others and to yourself. Uh, and, and it's a really simple message, but it's, uh, it's real difficult. <laughs> It sure is. And words we can all live by. I can hardly believe it, but we are just about out of time. And so I'm just curious if you have any parting words or advice for people kind of as they're facing what's going on in the world right now about a, a good way for them to proceed. Well, don't be a jerk. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, d uh, find out how you uh, are, yourself are, are contributing to the problems that you want to solve, uh, and and you'll and you'll have more success in in solving them. I think. I think those are the the main things. Yes. Amen. <laughs> well, thank you, Brad, so much for being here with me. Well, thank you. Uh, for more information about Brad Warner, you can visit him online at hardcorezen.info. And as always, if you enjoyed today's podcast, your five-star rating and or review in iTunes would be greatly appreciated and a huge help. I'd also like to invite you to join the New World Now podcast community on Facebook, where you can be a part of discussions and stay up to date on the latest and greatest podcast news. Simply search for New World Now podcast on Facebook to join the group, and I'll hope to see you there there and look forward to connecting on future episodes of New World Now.
Thank you for listening to New World Now with Kim Corbin from New World Library. New World Library publishes books and audio that inspires and challenges us to improve the quality of our lives and our world. For more information about their books and authors, visit them online at newworldlibrary.com. 